This is season one of the Constitutional Commons podcast. This season is called The Founders of the Constitution. Your host, Rob Nadelson, is a nationally known constitutional scholar and author whose research into the history and legal meaning of the Constitution has been cited repeatedly at the U.S. Supreme Court by both parties and by individual justices. In this podcast, you will learn about the lives of leading founders and their unique contributions to the Constitution. Hi, I'm Rob Nadelson, and welcome to the series, The Founders and the Constitution. This is part five. Edmund Randolph. Edmund Randolph was born into a family with a tradition of public service. His maternal grandfather had been King's attorney, the equivalent of attorney general, in colonial Maryland. His paternal grandfather, father, and uncle all held the same position in colonial Virginia. His uncle, Peyton Randolph, served as president of the first and second Continental Congresses. Edmund Randolph rose to his family tradition and exceeded it. He was born on August 10, 1753, in Williamsburg, Virginia. After attending William and Mary College, he clerked in his father's law office and in 1774 was admitted to the bar. When the revolution began the following year, his parents, who were loyalists, emigrated to Britain, but Edmund stayed to join the revolution. He enlisted in the Continental Army and became an aide-de-camp to General George Washington. When Uncle Peyton died, leaving Edmund as his heir, the young man obtained a discharge from the Army and returned to Virginia to wrap up his uncle's affairs. Once back home, his rise was meteoric. In May 1776, he was elected to the Virginia Convention tasked with creating a new government for the state free of British control. Although he was the youngest delegate to the convention, his colleagues placed him on the committee for drafting the new state constitution. Later that year, he was elected Attorney General of Virginia, a post he held for a decade. In September 1786, the Virginia legislature sent Randolph to the Annapolis Convention, along with his cousin James Madison and the budding legal scholar St. George Tucker. Randolph and his federal commissioners, or delegates, recommended that another interstate convention be held in Philadelphia the following year. The purpose was to design a new political system for America. Two months later, the Virginia legislature elected Randolph governor of the Commonwealth. As governor, he led his state's delegation to the Constitutional Convention. That convention was called to order on May 25, 1787. Four days later, Randolph rose and delivered a speech outlining the defects in the Articles of Confederation and offering a series of reforms. We know these proposals as the Virginia Plan. They became the primary basis for the convention's discussions for the next eight weeks. Some writers have assumed that the Virginia Plan was solely James Madison's creation. There's little evidence for this, and it, it seems unlikely. A delegation comprising such luminaries as Eben Randolph, George Washington, George Mason, the author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and George Wythe, America's first law professor, such a delegation would not rubber stamp the work of any one man. Randolph participated vigorously, and usually successfully, in the convention's deliberations, sometimes, but not always, in alliance with Madison. Randolph bore primary responsibility for constitutional clauses that first fixed the term of the House of Representatives at two years, a second addressed federal debts, third guaranteed each state a Republican form of government, fourth required an early census to determine each state's representation, and finally provided that the Constitution would become effective if ratified by nine of the 13 states. One of Randolph's greater moments was when he teamed up with John Dickinson of Delaware to ensure that only the directly elected House of Representatives, not the indirectly elected Senate, could propose new taxes. There was significant resistance to this proposal. However, as I noted in the previous installment in this series, Randolph and Dickinson accurately predicted that when the the ratification debates began, opponents would 
try to tar the Constitution as too aristocratic. Ensuring that only the People's House could propose taxes would blunt the attacks. Another important moment for Randolph was when he moved for a day's adjournment to allow heated tempers to cool. His motion passed, and the commissioners came back later in a more tractable mood. On July 26th, they directed a new Committee of Detail to prepare an initial draft of a constitution. The delegates elected to the committee were Nathaniel Gorham of Massachusetts, a former president of Congress who had served the convention as chairman of the Committee of the Whole, Oliver Ellsworth, Connecticut's foremost lawyer, James Wilson, Pennsylvania's foremost lawyer, John Rutledge, South Carolina's foremost lawyer, and Edmund Randolph. The convention went into recess and the Committee of Detail went to work. Randolph's colleagues entrusted him with preparing the initial outline. In other words, Randolph prepared the first draft of the first draft of the Constitution. On August 6, the convention reassembled and the committee presented its new draft. Its most striking feature was that instead of federal powers being stated in general terms, as in the Virginia plan, they were specifically itemized. Earlier in the summer, Randolph had thought it was premature to list specific federal powers, but the passage of time had clarified his thinking. The committee's listing or enumeration scheme became a central feature of the Finnish Constitution. Despite his success at the convention, Randolph balked at signing the Finnish document. He suggested changes that would enable him to sign, but his proposals were rejected. He concluded that the, that the only way to obtain the alterations he wanted was to permit state conventions to propose amendments, to be reviewed by a second federal convention held before final ratification. On October 10, 1787, he wrote a lengthy letter explaining why the Articles of Confederation should be cashiered in favor of a new federal system. But the letter also insisted that state conventions be permitted to suggest pre-ratification amendments. He observed that the procedure he favored was similar to the procedure by which the Articles of Confederation had been adopted. He expressed confidence that conventions in a majority of states would agree to such amendments. His prediction about what other states would do proved wrong. When the Virginia Ratifying Convention met in Virginia, met in Richmond on June 2nd, 1788, eight states already had approved the Constitution, and they had done so without insisting on any prior amendments. Massachusetts and South Carolina had proposed amendments, but to be adopted only after ratification. Randolph realized that Virginia's choices were reduced to this. Virginia could vote to ratify, resulting in union under the proposed Constitution, or Virginia could vote against ratification, likely resulting in no union at all. Randolph passionately chose union. However, the elections to the Virginia Convention the Virginia Ratifying Convention had not gone well for advocates of the Constitution. Not only were most of those elected skeptical about ratification, but the opponents included highly talented leaders, George Mason, James Monroe, the future president, and Patrick Henry, truly one of history's greatest orators. Henry could send his listeners into a trance and hold them there for five hours. If a thunderstorm arose while he was speaking, his oratory danced with the thunder and lightning, blending the elements to his cause. On the side of the Constitution were Madison, who, alas, was no orator, George Wythe, Edmund Pendleton, and the Commonwealth's top lawyer, uh, then the Commonwealth's top lawyer, Pendleton, and John Marshall, later Chief Justice of the United States. Randolph was charged with the daunting responsibility of taking the lead in responding to Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry specialized in attributing dark motives to his opponents. So Randolph needed to establish his patriotism at the very out outset. Mr. Chairman, he said, 
I am a child of the revolution. My country very early indeed took me under its protection at a time when I most wanted it. And by a succession of favors and honors, gratified even my most ardent wishes. With such a recital, no listener could believe that the young governor would betray America. Throughout Richmond's muggy June days, Randolph rose to his feet again and again. He delivered speeches of shimmering eloquence. He made his case while still conceding his desire for amendments. Ultimately, he helped negotiate a bargain between supporters of the Constitution and moderate opponents. The bargain was the convention proposed a long list of amendments, but they would be adopted only after ratification. Even so, the vote was close, 89 in favor and 79 against. In 1789, President Washington chose Randolph to be the first United States Attorney General. And in 1794, Washington chose him to be the second Secretary of State. Randolph did a competent job in both positions. However, a cabal within the cabinet eventually forced him to resign. The alleged reason was that Randolph had solicited bribes from the French ambassador. Randolph furiously protested his innocence, writing two pamphlets defending himself against the charges, and the verdict of history has been not guilty. He entered law practice where his success at the bar vied with his failure as a financial manager. He also composed a history of Virginia. Randolph died on September 12, 1813 in Millwood, Virginia. Like Dickinson, Randolph is persistently underestimated and underappreciated. Some writers characterize him as a temporizing mediocrity. But if you reread what you've just read or re-listen to what you've just heard, you can see that this judgment is perverse. And if any doubt remains, read his speeches to the Virginia Ratifying Convention, notes of which are available at the American Memory site of the Library of Congress website. If Randolph failed on any level, is that, is that it is that he was too honorable for the jungle that federal politics had become. As E. Lee Shepard wrote in the American Dictionary of National Biography, quote, he struggled throughout his political life to rise above faction and to support positions and policies that he deemed worthy of his advocacy. Unfortunately, with the establishment of the federal government and the broadening of the new national political arena, his high-minded approach to public service became increasingly untenable. If not for Edmund Randolph, America's most populous and most influential state, Virginia, would have rejected the Constitution. George Washington would have been ineligible for the presidency. The Union would have been smothered in its cradle. Thanks for listening. I'm Rob Nadelson. Thank you for listening to this episode from the series, The Founders of the Constitution. To make sure you never miss an episode, be sure to like this in your podcast app and subscribe to be notified every time a new episode is released. For more information about the U.S. Constitution and this series, head over to thinkfreedom.org. Thanks for listening.